Good afternoon, it's uh, good evening, sorry, it's um, what time is it? It's uh, 20 to 6 in the evening and uh, I just wanted to come say hello and thank you all again for tuning in, I suppose that's what we need to say as an expression, but thank you very much for coming to have a listen. I wanted, this is another kind of um, tales from the recording studio or something like that, I think I'll call it, so it'll probably be number three actually and uh, I've talked about, I think number one was about the Spanish kind of uh, job if you like or project that I was involved with and then the second one was more or less about a sort of kind of American um, project that I was involved with. So this one, so we've done Spain, we've done America, let's uh, stay in Europe maybe and uh, Germany. So I've also worked with some German artists and English artists that spend most of their time in Germany but I've done, done a few of them. But there was one particular project I worked on which was uh, just a couple of things about it which um, I thought were quite interesting so I just wondered, I thought I'll uh, share them with you. So, similar kind of thing in the sense of I get a telephone call from a record producer, Mike Vernon again, and I have to say on this particular one he was just brilliant, although it didn't start too well but it wasn't really his fault. Okay, So he's been engaged by this big record company, Virgin Records in Germany, via their management company who are also quite a big they could basically the management company that could release the album. I, found, I think they did the album prior to the one that this one I'm talking about now, which um, I think they did three. They've done three albums, I think. The first one they did, they did in Germany, paid for by the uh, management company. The second one they did is this one I'm going to talk about, and then following on from this one, they also got to do another one. So it must have gone all right. <coughs> <coughs> oh dear, I went down the wrong way. So anyway, telephone call, ding, ding, ding. Hello, Bob Ross Studios. Yeah, I'll take your money. Anyway, it's uh, Mike Vernon. Hello, Bob. It's Mike. Oh, Mike, Mr. Vernon, how are you, sir? I'm very well. How are you going? Bob, I've got a problem. Uh-oh, what's the matter? He said, well, I've got a gig to do this German band, to record this German band's album. And we've got a slight problem in that we've recorded the first three songs in a recording studio, and we spent 15, one five, 15,000 pounds. And this is 15 years ago. It's quite a lot of money even today, but in those days, of course, 15 years ago, it was probably even more. So anyway, they've gone in this recording studio, in Chipping Norton Recording Studios in the Chipping Norton. Lovely recording studio, very expensive, £1,000 a day. And they've recorded three songs, mixed them down, give them to uh, the record company, Virgin Records in Germany, who basically just turned around and went, don't like it. Uh, uh, right, so the management company aren't very happy. They've gone back to the producer and said, they don't like it. Uh-oh, we've got a problem. So Mike, Mike had a problem then, basically, because the the way that they'd gone about doing it. Again, I'm not suggesting that's my fault because I don't think it was anything to do with him. The band were kind of adamant about how they wanted to do what they wanted to do. And anyway, Mike's on the phone basically saying, I don't know what to do here, Bob. So I basically asked him, well, what, sorry, so you've recorded three songs, Mike? He said, well, we've recorded three songs. I've spent £15,000 and the record company don't like any of them. And I've got the gig to make an album with these guys. And they want a single. When these first three songs is supposed to be the single, so the record company can release the single to generate interest and hopefully custom customers for the album when it comes out. So I said, well, okay, what, what, what's the single then? And it, the single wasn't actually written by the band. All the other songs were, but the single was written by a couple of uh, MCA songwriters. And uh, it's called Drop Dead Beautiful. So I just said, uh, well, you know, what would you want me to do, Mike? He said, yeah, he didn't know. I just said, well, can I suggest something then? Why don't we, well, why don't you think about, it? just get it, perhaps, yes, I'll, I'll help you. Uh, it's a job, isn't it? Maybe, of course I'll do it. That's what I do. But, um, you know, it's not just about money, of course. Of course. Uh, I don't think anyone works in the music business just because of money. It lasts very long for as they did. So I just said, well, OK, well, let's, let me just do what it, whatever it is I do on these tracks. Send me a, a cassette or a tape or whatever and go, I'll go from there. I, I need to really hear it first, Mike, to, before I can do it. So anyway, he sent me the cassette through. Uh, I'm sure it was a cassette tape. Anyway, he sent me a cassette tape through. I listened to it. It was a really good song, of course, because it was um, been written by some top MCA songwriters. And it hadn't been released. No one had released it today. It had been written more or less for these for this band. And the singer had uh, uh, two, two guys. Uh, Akeem, A-C-H-I-M, and Marcus. Akeem was the singer, Marcus was uh, the guitar player. And uh, Akeem was basically spotted and found, if you like, by um, Seymour Stein, who was pretty much the same guy who discovered Madonna. And uh, he discovered Akeem. Akeem was a fantastic voice. Of course, he was German. But he spoke, 
uh, sung almost fluent English, apart from the first Wednesday. Which is a part of the, I'll come back to that. And Marcus was the guitar player, Lo- lovely guy. And uh, so anyway, so I suggested to write Vernon. Okay, well, why don't I just do whatever I do on these things? I'll, I'll do whatever I do on the drop dead beautiful, and I'll tell them now. But I was basically engaged, um, sorry, booked, or I mean, engaged in the sense of booked to do the job. And basically, it was just a sequencing job, more or less, to start with. So um, I charged them, obviously, a fee for doing that. And I did the song in my sequence the way I would have done it. Okay, because what they got already, they didn't like it, so it had to be different. So, but I, I can't help that. Anyway, it doesn't. It just means it's just how I approach things. Oh, it's just the way I go about them. Like I said to you before, it's, there's no. It doesn't mean I'm good, bad, or indifferent. It's just me being different and looking at things a different way than somebody else. We're all different in that regard. So I did what I did it the way. And uh, the band basically came down. Uh, I played them what I'd done. So the back I'd, again ripped ripped apart their backing track, and there wasn't their particular song. So it wasn't so sensitive to them this time. Whereas normally it would be with the, if I was messing with the band song, a bit like the Spanish band I mentioned to you earlier. So anyway, I've done the um, redone the backing track for this song. They've come down, the guys have come down, and then they liked it because it was nothing like they've done before. And they, uh, they just re- they went for it. Of course, we like this. Great. Well, this. So what we did then, they were still in the studio. We stayed down there. I've done all the the backing track sequencing samples. There were quite a few samples in there because it needed to be really hip, modern, just unusual and need to have a, a twist that would get it noticed in the marketplace when it went on the radio, all that kind of stuff. Because it didn't have that at that time. The three songs that they'd done just sounded like three songs could be from anybody. But anyway, so th- they stayed in the studio and we put the vocals on from Akeem and I was really impressed. Because again I set him up with my 414 microphone and my Focusrite Red 7. And I didn't used to root it through the mixing desk, I used to plug it basically straight from there, straight into the recording d- device. So it's as clean as... Okay, okay, it's a bit awkward in that sense, but it's, but it's the shortest route from A to B that I can do, which meant that the quality of the actual vocal sound, if you like, the technical aspect of it, was just as good as I could get it in my studio, because there was nothing in the way, straight out the back of the focus right, Red 7, you know, into the microphone, into the focus right, into, um, straight into the recording device, which was digital. Okay, so, um, anyway, so we did all that, we recorded it all up, finished it, and, uh, sent it over to the record company, which, which took a c- couple of weeks, I guess, for it to all get done, who I was very, 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 very thankful, the record company, who bear in mind they've already had these three versions of the three songs recorded at Chip and Norton Studios that they didn't like, so then they get this version that the band have come to my studio to do, so they're doing it with a, call me whatever you like, this guy from Portsmouth, Bob Ross, you know, this programmer, sequencer, whatever you want to call me, keyboard player, session guy, whatever, whatever, whatever give it, it doesn't, just a name. But the record company really liked it. And I was really, Mike Vernon was on the phone, yay! He's like, hey, Bobby, you're not going to guess, let me guess. So the, the Germans, they love it. Yeah, of course they love it, Mike, it sounds great, doesn't it? Don't you think? Oh, I was really chuffed with how it came out, to be honest. I mean, not just with the, I mean, I liked obviously what I'd done, the rest I wouldn't have done it. So I'd like to all the, the keyboardy bits and the, some, I, had a, I managed to get some great samples going. And I did something very unusual with the uh, drum track as well, which I'd never done before, but it came out fantastically well. But anyway, so the record company loved it. And they said to uh, Akeem and Marcus, we love this, this is much more uh, uh, what, what we should be doing. Go and do the rest of the album down with this guy, Bob Ross. Go and have sit, sit. I said, are you up, are you up that, Bob? Of course I am. Thank you very much. I think I was charging them £200 a day. And they basically ended up having 42 days. Not necessarily 42 days in my studio, although we did have 14 days in my studio, two weeks basically, to like pre-produce all of the album once we got the gig to do the album, you know, in, in the same kind of manner. And then there was times at other studios. We had a lot of session players involved with that, including some very, very, very nice people, not least of which was a guy called Mark Feltham, or Feltham, is a harmonica player from Nine Below Zero. Cool, he was good, I liked him. Nice chap as well. We had a nice little, we had a spliff together as well. Good need to finish. Mark, that's really good. I enjoyed that. Hello, mate. Oh, yeah. Got on quite well. Do you fancy, fancy a spliff? All right. Just have a quick spliff. Not, nothing major. No beer, no alcohol, of course. So have a quick spliff. That's all you need. Just to say thank you. And he went on his merry way. And uh, um, that all went really well. So we, the thing was that this Drop Dead Beautiful, the single that we'd done, the record company immediately put it out because that was like the first thing that we'd finished as a recording. The three songs we re- they'd recorded at Chippy Norton basically got binned and the one song that I- I'd done after being sort of um, sequestered by Mike Vernon to do it 
which was Drop Dead Beautiful, did my sort of version of that, or helped help them get to that with my input, if you like. It went, they released it as a single straight away before they'd recorded the rest of the album. And it went straight into the charts in Germany and it ended up being on their German A playlist for 18 months. So the record company were just ecstatic, you know, and so were the band, of course. But um, it, it was re a really good thing. But when we got to do the actual album, so we've done the single, Drop Dead Beautiful, it's done, it's out there, it's already happening. I've got a lovely job, which I've started work on. I think it was just during those first sort of 14 days that they booked to do all the programming and setting up, if you like, all the uh, routining and pre-production, it's called, and uh, on the rest of the songs that's gone on the album. One of which was just a sort of band, which was that actually, that actually, rubber band, rubber band, man, man, band, it was a bit like that kind of thing, you know, from, I don't know, some motown type of thing from a bit obscure, but Mike, Mike had found it and played it to the band and said, oh, why don't we do a version of this, you know, as a cover, yeah, as well as the Drop Dead Beautiful, so there are two covers on the album. So they decided, yeah, okay, we'll do that. So we just kind of got the track together. And I, I said to Mike, Mike, this track's called Rubber Band Man. I said, and I was doing the bass, I did all the bass lines on the keyboard and all, all pretty much everything, really, drums, bass, and some of the keyboards. Uh, although the band had a brilliant, brilliant keyboard player who came and did loads of keyboards or some keyboards on top as well. He was staggering. I liked him as well. He was like, wow, how did you do that? I really liked him. But anyway, this song, Rubber Band Man, I said to Mike, we're doing it, it just came into my head, as things generally do sometimes, and it's just, pop. Mike, oh, just had a thought, can I share it with you? The bass line, that I'm playing on the keyboard, why don't we sample a rubber band, why don't you get, I found a plastic band, you know, here's an elastic band, go and stand by the mic and just go, dun, 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 by the mic, I'll record it and sample it, and then we'll stick that in the sampler, and I'll play it on the keyboard, going, dun, 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 and tune it to all the notes. But it sounds more complicated than that. She is, because I've done that kind of thing before, and it's only repetition, these things. Once you've done them, you know how to do them. So, um, but we, anyway, so we ended up doing that, and so the bass line of this rubber band man track is actually an elastic band. It just sounds great. I love it. So did the band, like, why? Because we, we just needed something different, just to sound a little bit different than everybody else. This is what the record company will call a twist. You know, you need, you've got to have a twist in, in, in your outfit as a band or else the record company won't touch you. And you also need to have a, that pulse thing. Whatever your pulse is in your track, you know, whatever it is, which I spoke of the other day, unless you've got that, and unless you really smack it, the record company, between the eyes with that, this is the pulse, you are getting this, aren't you? Making it really, really obvious. Unless you've got that as a band, the record company won't touch you. Okay? But if you've got the pulse, or whatever it is, you've got the pulse, and you've got a good vocalist there, you've got chances. That's one other thing we had um, on this rubber band man, I said that we did the bass line, it was actually an elastic band, it was great, oh, I really liked it. So, anyway, the um, one of the lo lyrics in there, because it, like, it was like a party bit in the middle, where it was when everyone got a bit of party atmosphere, and there's lots of percussion and stuff, which turned out to be really quite good fun to do, in terms of, the, from a musical perspective. But, um, Achim was doing this slight lyric, and the lyric was, uh, it wasn't, wasn't much, it just said, ooh, it makes me woozy. Oh, this, you know, this music kind of thing, or this sort of feeling of the party atmosphere, oh, it's making me woozy. Which is dead easy, isn't it? Well, not for a German, because for a German, it comes out, oh, it makes me woozy. So, oh, no, no. Uh, Wednesday, it will be white woozy. Just say that, Achim. So I was trying to coach him somehow to get him to say Wednesday. Uh, sorry, to say woozy instead of boozy. Wednesday, it will be Wednesday, boozy. <laughs> he couldn't get it. Uh, so uh, we just went over. It took almost a day to get that. And I just said to Mike, Mike, let's get up with this. He's not going to be able to get this. It's not his fault. It's just you know, it's just the way he's developed his speech and uh, it's his lexicon. You know, that's how we talked. So I, I had a sample, if you like, of Achim saying boozy because that's as close as he could get it. And I just said to Mike, Mike, why don't you go and stand behind the microphone and just say woozy, as an English person would say it. And I'll just pinch that off the front of the woozy and put it on top of Achim's. So we've got Mike Vernon's w and the oozy from Achim, which is what we did, basically. And uh, the sampler was quite intelligent in the sense it could, like, mesh them together and you can't spot the joint. Just, and, oh, it makes me woozy. This is Achim saying it. Anyway, we got there, but uh, that was a, a really fun, fun kind of job, and uh, from two perspectives, I guess. One, that I was very happy that the fact that it was that successful, where it was started off going down the toilet with the three songs they recorded, spent a wedge of money, 15 grand, down the toilet. Uh, Mike Vernon, was, he probably was having kisses, but bless him, he, he was just brilliant on this job. 
We ended up actually, after doing this album, which was, um, I think the album might have been called, I can't remember if it was called Drop Dead Beautiful. That was the fir- certainly the first um, first sort of single. The band was called Six Was Nine, which was like a kind of um, a bit of a play on words with uh, uh, a famous old song from that famous old uh, rock guitarist from the 60s. You know what I mean? If Six Was Nine. And uh, they called themselves Six Was Nine. But uh, there you go. It was a fabulous, fabulous uh, project, and I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed it from the point of view was I made a bass line out of the a rubber band, which was quite interesting, <coughs> and um, helped a German who couldn't say the word woozy, woozy, because it came out woozy, helped him sound like he was saying the word woozy, which was uh, quite interesting. There's probably a whole lot of other stuff that went off with that, but uh, plus it was a nice earner for me, because like I say, I did 42 days on that job, including being there present at the mixing, because I had to be there for the mixing, because I... 95% or 80% of what was coming out musically had been done for me through my system, computer system, you know. I basically used to get it all recorded in my studio and take it up with my computer to this big um, sort off studio, you know, in London, which I can't remember, Britannia Row, I think it was, with, with, a, with an engineer, a guy called Rafe McKenna, R-A-F, Foxtrot, uh, Echo, Rafe McKenna. Oh, this guy was seriously good. I can't, I just want to quickly tell you this before I go, I'm going to have to go in a minute, but he basically walked into the recorder studio and said to the sort of house engineer, he said, uh, I just want to play a CD please through the monitors, speakers, is that alright with you? I said, yeah, fine. So he got this CD that he'd obviously brought with him, something that he was familiar with, Rafe McKenna, bungs it in the CD player and plays it, not particularly loud, but he's playing through the system, he just sits down in the middle, with his, right in the middle of the speakers, he must have listened to, what, 20 seconds of it? He just like turn the volume down on the mixing desk and he gets on the phone, picks up the phone. Can you send the engineering please? <coughs> so anyway, I'm sat there in, sort of in the corner with all my computers set up, all there ready, and there's all the massive, massive the mixing desk. You wouldn't get it in the you know, the mixing desk must have been six metres wide. Anyway, so the engineer comes in, following the call from Rafe, and says, uh, yep, can I help you? What's the problem? So Rafe just says, uh, your uh, quad bus is one dB louder on one side than it is on the other. And this bloke was not, not, not impressed. This bloke was like, he was almost uh, offended. He said, you what? He said, you're, um, he, he could see he was like, not happy bunny. And he was trying to make, he said, don't be daft. He said, there's nothing wrong with it. He said, it's fine. We just had the long pigs in. They've just done an album for 10 days. They finished last night. I mean, this is why you come in. This, that's why your session started today. You couldn't come in before today. We've just done the long pigs. They never complained. Everything's fine. So Rafe just said, do me a favour, please. Can you just go and get the... This Massenberg, which is like this device that's probably on the six inches high by two foot wide by 18 inches deep, and it's full of serious electronics. It's like five grand's worth of kit, you know, and it's just to measure the levels and uh, all that kind of stuff. I won't go into it too much, but basically that's it. Anyway, so the guy get, gets the old test device out, sticks it through the mixing desk, one dB louder on the right hand side. And this engineer apologised, said, oh, I'm really sorry, you're right mate, thanks very much. He's, and Rafe just said, well, I wouldn't have said anything to you if it, hadn't been, if, it been, if it hadn't been a problem. I wouldn't have mentioned it, would I? I like this Rafe McKenna, I liked him very much. And uh, so the engineer goes off and they make the adjustment to the mixing desk. I was so impressed. Oh, Christ. He listens to 20 seconds of a CD and he can tell whether it's an SSL desk. You know, a quarter of a million pounds worth of mixing desk. And he spotted in 20 seconds that it was not quite as good as it should, should have been. So that was quite impressive. And uh, every day, at the end of every day, um, Rafe, I used to um, say goodnight to the studio. I used to work till like 2 a.m. in the morning, start from like 10 in the morning, work till 2 a.m. at night. So you had to work long hours, although the fee was quite good, like I say, £200 a day. This is 15 years ago, for me, I mean. Uh, Rafe was on about 350 a day, because I asked him, what sort of rate you want to charge Rafe? It's 350 a day. All right. So, worth every penny. Worth every penny. That, that, the mix of that album, I've heard the album since, of course. The mix on that album, with all the bits, is just Monty. It's just whoa. all the little bits that I've got happening in there from a musical, just like a, from a selfish point of view, all my sort of musical keyboard bits, if you like, rather than, which is what I'm used to, is having, I can't really hear that, or something's not right about it in the mix of it, you know, because it was done by someone else. On the ones I've, that I've mixed, though, I was happy with them, but generally not. But this one with Rafe McKenna was just staggeringly good. Anyway, that's probably enough for that, and uh, this is my um, Tales from a Recording Studio 3. So, Akeem and Marcus, 6 was 9, Virgin in Germany, 
uh, spent fifteen thousand pound, three songs down the toilet. Uh, we did we did one of the songs, dropped it beautiful, and it was a massive hit in Germany. A record company said, right, go back and do the whole whole album like that, which we did. And then uh, rubber the rubber band man thing with the sample that was good fun, and you know, with the elastic band using that as the bass sample, and Rafe McKenna coming in and spotting that the one side of the mixer desk was uh, one dB out on one side in like five seconds, ten seconds flat. He spotted it. So all that was good. We, the band also did got to do a second album. Which was good because I did get to do some work on that and on that second album. Which I, there is a story to that which I want to share with you. On a, I'm going to do it on another one um, because it involves um, two very very well-known session drummers, Steve. Fer Fer I can't even say him. Steve Ferroni, the famous drummer, fabulous drummer, and uh, Willie Weeks, the bass player. Which I'll talk to you about that in version, or you know, the next version of this. So I'm going to end it there. I don't know how this has been. I'm hoping the audio has been better on this. I've recorded this slightly differently gone back to how I used to do it rather than doing it online through the YouTube application because that seems to be part of the problem I think. So I've also decided that uh, I have this 900 pound mix uh, microphone which I've got sitting down there and not using it. It seems daft not to rather than use this sort of 20 quid I mean, microphone that's rubbish and as soon as you raise your voice at all it goes <laughs> So I'm hoping and hoping that the, the audio on this is not too offensive. Thank you, thank you so much again for listening and um, I hope you've enjoyed that and uh, yeah, if you get a chance to check out this, 6 was 9, Drop Dead Beautiful. I think that it's actually, I found it on the, um, YouTube. So the, I'll, if I can find it, I'll put a link down in the description, if I find it. I'm sure they, I'm sure I saw it the other day on there. I have a lot. And I just like the intro. It's just, you might listen to it. I think, well, what's he on about? But it's just the intro, the, the drum fill at the beginning is, uh, is Fox, two of the best drummers on the planet. I was so chuffed because they couldn't play it. Because they wanted to like play what I played on the, when they came to play play it later on another another kind of version of it, and they couldn't get it. They go, "What have you done then?" Ah, I'm not telling you. Anyway, thank you so much for listening, and bless you all, and uh, be happy, and uh, look after those children. They're our future. They're the most important things on this planet. Are our children, and I'm just hoping there'll be a day once where everybody on the planet thinks that. And everything that every human does on this planet is in the best interest of our kids. As soon as we get that in our bonces, things might start brightening up around here in all sorts of ways. Thank you very much, and uh, please um, go out there and do whatever it is you do as best as you can. I love you all. Thank you so much. Cheerio.